Welcome to another edition of 1036 here on Milwaukee PBS. I'm your host, Portia Young. In celebration of Women's History Month, we'll introduce you to a Wisconsin woman who was the Army's first African-American female major general, and now she's inspiring young girls to become strong leaders. We'll look at a program helping barbers and hairstylists in the African-American community reduce the stigma around mental health. And we want to talk more about mental health in our youth, beginning with an important follow-up to our documentary, Kids in Crisis, You're Not Alone. The documentary profiled four diverse young people with mental health challenges such as bullying, depression, anxiety, and navigating transgender issues in our society. The film is encouraging other youth to speak up and get help. I just, I'm like, like amazed um, of the courage that you guys have to like be where you are. And I was just kind of wondering like how long it took for you to get to that point from when you felt like you were kind of at like your worst point. It just started with me like being able to tell like a small group of people and then like that small group of people kept building and I kept telling more small groups of people and it made like big groups of people and then like eventually like, I could just, I just feel comfortable enough being able to talk to everybody. It's also leading to new laws in Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers signed two new laws to help improve youth mental health care in the state. By 28. <laughs> Joining me now is Rory Lenane, co-producer of the documentary and reporter for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, our partner in this film. Rory has been reporting on youth mental health for several years now. Welcome back to 1036, Rory. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, we've seen the documentary and its effect that it's had in our community. It's really making change happen in a good way. So let's talk about the changes that are happening now in state government because of this film. Yeah, um, well, there's two new laws, actually. Um, they came from state representatives Joan Balwig and Steve Doyle, um, who chair the bipartisan state task force on suicide prevention. And we had actually done a screening for the members of that task force at Ripon College and had some of the young people from the film there. They did a question and answer session with the members. And then they asked us to show the film again at the Capitol, um, where the young people were able to participate again. And uh, Representative Joan Balwig told us that those uh, two new laws were inspired by uh, watching the film and talking with the young people at those screenings. The testimony and the documentary of the young people, uh, TJ, Alex, uh, Raina, and Barrett, um, was very helpful. And uh, we continue to talk about how, how brave they were in reaching out and, and really synthesizing uh, what it was like to struggle with uh, behavioral health issues from many different angles. And they were a real inspiration for especially our peer-to-peer legislation that was, was signed into law today. And the things that were done by um, uh, the uh, documentary crew has been, I think, very helpful in helping uh, people around the state and my colleagues in the legislature to understand the, the crisis of uh, youth behavioral health. The first law will provide grants to high schools to either start or support ongoing peer-to-peer suicide prevention programs, and that bill was signed into law at Milton High School. And you were there, Rory, when the governor signed that bill, and he talked about the importance of breaking down the stigma. Yeah, and he actually shared a personal story about his own connection to the issue. I know it's tough to be a student. I was one at one time a long time ago, but uh, it is difficult. It's even more difficult today. Uh, as been, been mentioned before by Senator Ringhan, I had a nephew that committed suicide and if he, he had access to a friend, I'm sure he, to start the process of healing, uh, I'm sure he would be with us today also. We know that many times our schools don't have the resources they need to help struggling students. So this bill aims to bring the training and the support directly to the students wherever they're at, in the classroom, in the cafeteria, at practice, in their social services, our social circles, 
And it's another tool in the toolbox that helps students get the support that they need to prevent suicide. It's a difficult topic to talk about suicide, but it is the second leading cause of death among young people. So not talking about it isn't an option. These types of programs help remove the stigma. After the governor spoke, there were dozens of students that came up to ask questions, um, and you could tell they were really interested in um, mental health policy and just excited to have a chance to talk about these programs. Well, that's really great to hear because that peer-to-peer -peer support, that's what's, that's what's most important. And we also found out that there are several new chapters of Red Gen popping up in local schools, and Red Gen was featured in the documentary, and it stands for Resilience Through Education for a New Generation. Yeah, there's a new chapter um, at Pius XI High School, which is where we actually premiered the documentary. Um, there's also a new chapter at Thomas Jefferson Middle School in Port Washington. Um, and beyond that, throughout the state, there are schools starting um, Hope Squad and Sources of Strength, which are other peer-based mm -hmm. prevention programs. So Rory, how do the RedGen programs and the other ones like them, how do they work? Yeah, um, well RedGen is specific to Southeast Wisconsin and um, they have uh, volunteers who can help students set up um, basically clubs in their schools um, to talk about mental health and do different awareness initiatives around mental health. Um, and then Hope Squad and Sources of Strength are both national programs um, that cost some money, so these grants will help um, schools actually be able to afford them um, because then they send in national trainers to help get the program set up and provide some resources. Um, and I was actually able to attend one of the training sessions in Appleton, so I got to see how it worked. Um, and they brought together um, students from you know every different kind of sector of the school together and they uh, really had open discussions about mental health and did some leadership building and team building activities and they talked and strategized about um, you know what do we do if we see a student who seems to be kind of falling through the cracks or might not have anyone to talk to like how can we reach out to that student and they all kind of shared strategies about that um, and then also talked about different projects they could do like social media campaigns or events to raise awareness about mental health. Rory, the governor signed the second bill into law in Ashland earlier this month. Yeah, that's right. And um, that law requires student ID cards to have the suicide prevention hotline printed on them, um, which will just make it that much easier for students to be able to quickly find that number. If they're, they're, they personally are in crisis or if someone they know is in crisis, they can really quickly get that help. Right. So before you go, we do want to have one last update. Um, how are the four young people who were featured in the documentary film, how are they doing now? Barrett, TJ, Alex, Raina? Yeah, um, they're great and we all keep in touch. Um, I think it's important to note that it hasn't all been great. You know, they still continue to have um, mental health challenges um, and it's, there are ups and downs just like there are in anyone's life. Um, but they've been so strong and resilient and um, the film I think has been, uh, they've said it's been really helpful for them and um, given them, you know, something to, to be proud of and uh, a vehicle for connecting with other people and just a platform and um, they've really taken off with that. So um, it's really great to see all the great things they're doing in their communities and how they continue to be involved in um, speaking about the film and participating in screenings. It's also been well received by the community. Tell us a little bit more about the screenings that have been happening just across the state. Yeah, um, there's been screenings uh, in schools, um, like K-12 schools and colleges for uh, mental health professionals, um, a lot of different people. And um, the feedback has been great to just hear these um, personal stories is um, kind of a rare opportunity. And um, it's, it's influenced a lot of other people to want to share their own stories too. Like to see these four people being brave and willing to talk about it um, has just really opened a lot of conversations around the state. And I want to talk to you personally. You've been, you know, kind of the linchpin to all of this. How do you see yourself now, this kind of seems like almost a crusade or a really a mission for you to be able to shine a light on this. Yeah, I mean, it's just great to see all of this come to fruition um, from having worked on this for so long and um, really being able, I think I'm quoting the film now, being able to see the change happening. Um, we really are seeing that and yeah, so that's just been great to see. And what, what's been a personal takeaway for you, like something that you're gonna remember for the rest of your life? 
Um, I think just like how how brave um, the four young people were to take that step and share something that's really difficult to open up about. I think that's that's something, yeah, I hope to be able to do in my own life too. All right, thank you, Rory. Thank you very much. Thank you. And remember, you can always see the toolkit that we have to be able to help with youth and mental health and to start these discussions that we need to have across our state. Just go to jsonline.com slash you're not alone. You can also go to milwaukeepbs.org slash kids in crisis if you want to see the documentary and request a screening at your school or organization. Milwaukee PBS will re-air the documentary May 21st at 7.30 p.m. Cutting mental health stigma is also the goal inside Milwaukee barbershops and hair salons, primarily for African-American clients. According to the National Office of Minority Health, African-Americans are 10% more likely to have psychological distress than whites, yet half as likely to receive mental health treatment or counseling. A new program is helping stylists recognize and lessen emotional distress so clients can leave looking and feeling good. Since a little girl, I love the way salon smells and the idea of people walking in one way and coming out another way. And it's just like a new attitude. And so that's always been interesting for me to watch that transformation, which is like psychology for me. My name is Simone Kilgore, and I am the owner of Beauty Master Salon and Spa here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, I've been in the business of cosmetology for 25 years. Without mental health or mental well-being, we're not healthy, right? I'm also a licensed professional counselor, and I do lots of work in the community, but my focus is trauma. We are at UWM Zilber's School of Public Health, and what we're doing is we're offering a training called Style with Substance for barbers, stylists, nail techs, so people in the grooming industry to train them to better understand mental health, mental illness, the spectrum of that, how it shows up, and to better equip them to help their clients when they're coming in for services. I decided to come here because, I mean, I think it's essential, you know, that we learn as much as we can about mental health. If you guys, professionals, can you know, show us, teach us, you know, to how to identify some things, you know, uh, that we can be a great source uh, for resources, you know, for individuals that might come through our path. We don't talk about um, the high rates of suicide amongst black folks. It's just something that historically we just didn't talk about. I think this is so great for our community. I think we should keep doing this because we hear so much and it's almost like, you sharing this with me? Like, now what I'm supposed to do with this? But it's we gotta <laughs> encourage, we minister, yes. we cry, we follow up. Yep. And it's not only we wanna make people feel look good, we make them feel good as well. <laughs> The barber salon, the beauty shop has been the place where people go and they let their hair down, literally and figuratively. And so because people are coming and not just taking care of the outside, they're also releasing something from the inside, we thought it was best to start with them to prepare them to be better support. Kind of mean. People tend to open up a lot. You'd be surprised how much people want to share in a salon setting. But the magic that happens here and at most salons in the black community is a sense of community where you can talk crap and you can talk smack and you can have fun and you can tell jokes and we can pray and we can laugh and we can hug and we can support each other. Her hair requires quite a bit of heat. <laughs> if I wasn't a loyal customer. <laughs> I love you dearly, darling. I know. It's like a judgment-free zone. So, you know, the stylist is like a your personal therapist without <laughs> it being out there that you're going to a therapist. Yeah, it's taboo in a black community. So it's kind of nice to have that person that you can talk to without judgment or feeling judged. I know all her secrets. <laughs> She's the gatekeeper. No. <laughs> it's, it's relaxing because when you come in, you may not be in a good mood, but once you start talking to them and then they share things with you that maybe someone else has been going through, then I feel good, I feel better.
feel-good part is being able to have that camaraderie with other men, to talk about men issues, to talk about things that we normally don't get to talk about on a day-to-day -day basis. But that Saturday morning in the barbershop, we letting it all hang out, man. We got two vets, our Navy and Army. We won't get into who's better. We're just gonna leave that one alone. Let's, let's give them that. It's their day. It's their day. Airborne race. Let, let's move on. Let's move on. Man, any topic that come up in here, everybody got a comment. It's just an open community. Yeah. Like what goes on in the barbershop stays at the barbershop pretty much. <laughs> I love being a barber, number one. Um, first of all, you can make people look good. Um, you look good, you feel good. It's also an opportunity for me to um, share my story, for me to hear other people's stories, because we all got one. My name is Ed Hennings. I am an entrepreneur, a motivational speaker, an author, and the owner of the Hair Co. Barber and Beauty Salon. The barber's job is, is, is very unique in the sense that they will share with us so many things that they won't share with somebody that's a loved one. They might not even share that with them, but they'll get in this barber chair and say, hey man, you know what? I've been having this issue. And I have been talking to people in the shop for a long time about mental health. And people are starting to understand that there is a mental health problem and we gotta start there first. Cause it's eventually gonna happen. You know, you could be in this industry 10 years, but 10 years in a day, somebody comes through that door and say, hey, Man, I just had an episode in my life, man, and you, you, you better equipped to respond to that. A lot of people um, do come here with a lot on their shoulders. You see, I, I come here with my granddaughter because my daughter's in a situation. This is the one place where there's no trouble, and if the, you know, there's no trouble, and if you have trouble, you probably will leave it here. He's more than just a guy that just styles you, cuts your hair. He's like a priest, he's like a brother sometimes, he's like a therapist. I got clients that just want to talk to me because like a like a, a, a therapist or something, you know? so you like a therapist or some people. Oh, I thought some of my clients about what I, you know, I go through sometimes, you know, have a personal relationship. And you know, and stuff can get real deep like that too, where you real, like I really need to talk to you, man. Like, hey, sometimes Barbara need that, that therapeutic talk too. Have you had clients who have like shared some pretty heavy stuff or like? Yes. Yeah. To the point where I was in tears, we had to go in the back and pray. Um, I had to call the next day like, how are you doing now? After you get a cut, you just want to sit there before you go back to work or anything in that nature and just chill, talk about, you know, life and just talk about um, what you're going through in life, work, and sometimes just come in to just relax your mind. Since the salons and barbers are such hubs in the community and places where people share and places where people tell their most deepest, darkest secrets, to me it's like we're first responders in the community. We know we get the information first, why not have information to pass along? I think a lot of work goes into it from um, the conversations you have to um, the services that you provide. It all, it all plays a part in somebody's walking, somebody walking out of here with a wonderful feeling. A positive and determined attitude helped a Verona, Wisconsin woman blaze her own trail, becoming the U.S. Army's first African-American female major general, and now she's helping young girls think the same way. As part of Women's History Month, we salute Marsha Anderson's frame of mind. When I first came into the Army, I was very aware that it was a largely a white male organization. And I didn't look around and see a lot of people who looked like me, and certainly not at the officer ranks. My name is Major General Marsha Anderson, and I'm retired from the United States Army. I was in the military for about 37 years. It was very accidental, it was very serendipitous. I really um, signed up for one reason, and that was because I needed some college credits. And at registration, back in those days, you registered standing in giant gyms and stood in line and hoped not to get cut out of class. And there was one line that had no people in it. 
and it said Military Science Department. And that's how I got into ROTC. When I was promoted to Major General in 2011, I was the first African-American woman to achieve that rank in the history of the Army, and I achieved federally recognized rank. In many cases, those positions put you in charge of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. It was really um, very humbling and a little scary because I felt a great sense of responsibility that I needed to get this right. Because if I messed it up, if I was, uh, there was some investigation, if I did something wrong, it was gonna be super amplified and it would make it that much harder for the next person or persons to try to achieve that rank. And someone told me once who looked at my photos, she said, you're always smiling in your pictures. Most people aren't, they look like they're taking their driver's license picture or they just came from the dentist and they're not happy. When you're a senior person in the military, is take care of the people who work for you. Keep them safe, take care of them personally and professionally, and, and treat them as people. Real, they're not assets, they're people. I never forgot that, so I'm, I tried to make that a focus for the things that I did. When I was leaving Fort Knox, a group of young um, uh, African-American female officers who worked there, um, they couldn't give me anything of real value because there's a prohibition against accepting things like that from subordinates, but they put this together and gave me this hammer um, just to signify that I, I had cr broken the glass ceiling and become a major general and they were very proud of me. I feel very lucky to be in this room with you, I'll just put it that way, because I know you're smart. From some of the things you've said, you don't even realize it. Your friends may act like they have all the answers, but when you see some of the decisions they make, we know they don't really have all the answers. Does everybody in here get eight hours of sleep a night? <laughs> yeah, I knew the answer to that was no. I got involved with um, the students at Badger Ridge Middle School in Verona because my husband's a member of the 100 Black Men of Madison, and he was working with some of the black males at the middle school as part of the SORA project. And apparently someone, on the, someone asked him, well, what about our girls? Today I want to talk about being assertive, standing up for yourself, things you can do in, in certain situations to just assert yourself. So we're gonna go through a couple of examples of that. And I thought, I need to start talking to them right now about being assertive, because I didn't figure that out until I was out of college. And I think I missed a lot of opportunities to stand up for myself or to ask for things that I need. And that's what I wanted them to understand. Your teacher's confusing you in class, and well, how do you feel about trying to raise your hand and say, I don't understand what's going on? I think sometimes the problem is like also that like <laughs> before, like you can't raise your hand because you feel like, like you'll be like dumb while like everybody else gets in and like you like only one who doesn't. But it's okay to ask for what you need. If you need people to listen to you, if you have somebody to work with you, people to respect you, to people to appreciate you, it's perfectly okay. That's being assertive, but that's getting what you personally need and there's nothing wrong with that. It dawned on me that some of them in the room were very smart, but they would never speak up. I had to pull things out of them, and that reminded me of me when I was that, when I was them and I was that age. And remember, being assertive isn't about being aggressive. It's just about standing up for yourself. It's an annual award. I, was, I think I was the first woman to receive this award from the uh, Association of the U.S. Army, um, and just in recognition of my efforts to integrate the reserves into the active Army, um, to make it more a part of the organization. So the James Earl um, Rudder um, Medal was kind of in recognition of those efforts. If I could change anything, there'd be two things I'd change. I would want people to be more educated about the fact that we need to have more people of color in the military and not shy away from it because they think it's all about combat. Because 95% of what we do in the military is not combat. Um, there's a lot of humanitarian work that people don't even realize happens in the military. And then the other thing is I wish people were more educated about traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress.
I think there are misperceptions about hiring people who may have had those experiences in their lives. I wish people would educate themselves more, and I think we need to do a better job in the military about educating people. Quite frankly, you're not going to have another Colin Powell, and you're not going to have another me if you don't encourage people to serve. That'll do it for this edition of 1036. Be sure to check us out at milwaukeepbs.org and on Facebook. Thanks for watching 1036. We'll see you next month. Right now, we leave you with the view from above. <laughs>